Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Winnie Van Lanningham, or Rats the Tabaxi Tricksters, they call me in the Forgotten Realms. And the new trailer for Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves just dropped. It looks like we're actually getting a good D&D movie after all these years. Today, I'm taking you frame by frame through the Honor Among Thieves trailer to point out every D&D tale you might have missed. Like the previous trailer, this one opens on Neverwinter, located in Northwest Faerun, this time approaching the city by land instead of sea. As I said in my last breakdown, the Coliseum next to Castle Never is interesting because it doesn't appear on any official D&D &D maps. In the writer and director's breakdown of this trailer via IGN, John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein tell us that some scenes in Neverwinter were actually filmed on the old Game of Thrones King Landing set. Although the last time we saw King's Landing, it was destroyed by a dragon. So they joked about having to spruce the place up. According to John and Jonathan, Edgin and Holga returned to Neverwinter in order to reunite with someone. But because of their outcast status in town, they're caught and sentenced to execution. Holga wastes no time using her barbarian strength and brutal fighting techniques to escape the battle guards. She picks up a stone tile from the ground and absolutely wails on these dudes with it. Looks like she has the tavern brawler feet, because Argyle is proficient in wielding improvised weapons. John and Jonathan tell us that these combat sequences were filmed similarly to Jackie Chan movies like The First Strike, so that the audience can really see every single maneuver. It's clear from this clip that while Holga has no problem diving right in whipping ass, Edgin is reluctant to get his hands dirty. While she fights off a whole barrage of armed guards, he tries to use a dull staircase to break the ropes tying his hands. Like in the previous trailer, we see a brief shot of the spine of the world, the mountain range that stretches across Faerun. Next, Edgin, Zank, Holga, and Simon ride on horseback through what I think is the outer rim of the Dread Ring, located in Neverwinter Woods. The writer and director also updated us on Daisy Head's character's name. She's Sophina, one of the Red Witches of Fae, and here she's holding the big bad MacGuffin of the film. My theory is that this is a Drakhorn, and that the Red Wizards of Fae are going to use it not only to call upon an army of chromatic dragons, but also to turn those dragons into undead dracoliches. Zang tells us a few moments later that the Red Wizards have already created an army of the undead. And you know what would take that up a notch? A second army of dracoliches. Next, we see Sostam, the charming charismatic leader of Fae, and also a necromantic lich. John Francis Daly said this about his character. Zastam uh, is someone that will be recognized by by longtime players. He's a character who comes from the lore. He's super creepy and he's very powerful and there's a lot of kind of mystery about him. Edgin does refer to him as the greatest evil the world has ever known, but we also now know that each character will be specifically affected by Sostam's destruction for their own individual reasons. Later on in the trailer, we see Edgin with his wife and daughter outside of a thatched roof home, hinting at a tragic backstory that will likely end with both of them dead. So we can assume that his trauma will stem from that. After Sophina performs Misty Step at the arena, the crowd tries to flee, but are blocked by other Red Wizards of Fae using Wall of Force. Zank goes full paladin trope to give us some drama exposition, leaving no room for Simon's humor. Since the last trailer dropped, we've also learned more valuable information about Simon's character. According to John and John, Simon is a wild magic sorcerer who comes from a long line of successful famous wizards and sorcerers, aka Simon is a Nepo baby. Interestingly, this description for Simon's action figure on Amazon says that he's a descendant of the great wizard Elminster Amr, also known as the Sage of Shadowdale. He's also one of the most powerful spellcasters in existence and learned every single common spell in the realms. He can also heal himself, sense magic auras, shapeshift, and has psionic abilities. I believe that the old mage Simon is seen with later on in the trailer is Elminster, communicating with Simon with his psionic powers. In this scene, Simon is wearing the Helm of Destruction, and when the sage boops it, he goes flying backwards. John and John confirmed in their breakdown that Simon doesn't start off in the movie as a great powerful sorcerer. He's a wild magic sorcerer whose spells don't always work according to plan. So my guess is that this heart-to-heart -heart with his ancestor helps him tap into and control his wild magic. When J&J &J mentioned that Simon was a wild magic sorcerer, he was casting a spell on this boat. If this scene connects to that comment, he could be experiencing a wild magic surge that turns his spell into something else, possibly fog cloud judging by the moisture in the air. These guys also mentioned that this movie will explore different planes of existence, so this could potentially take place in the astral plane. We can see what looks like an ocean and floating boulders, and things seem to take bizarre shapes here. The astral plane is a transitive plane that intersects with the many planes of existence, allowing travel between between them. While the plane itself is kind of like outer space, it also has bits of other planes that get drawn in and float about. My other guess would be that this is the ethereal plane, which is another transitive plane. And while it can be described as a great ocean, it's much more ghostly. Zank asks his homies to follow him to the orifice, which is already a gross word. It turns out to be a giant hole in the ground, and I think that this may be the way that the gang 
travels to the Underdark and eventually to Grakalsta. Flanking the Colosseum are two statues. I think that the one on the right is Lord Nishar Alagonda, a former adventurer, owner of Castle Never, and ruler of Neverwinter. He founded the Alagondor royal family, and his bloodline carried on leading the city for many years. The figure on the left could be his son, Ban Alagondor, or one of his bodyguards from the Neverwinter Nine. Do you get really excited to watch a new show or movie only to find that it's not available in your country? RRR made me more curious about what's going on in Bollywood, but most of that stuff isn't available in the US, unless you're using NordVPN. With NordVPN, I can switch my virtual location on my device with one click, letting me access streaming services from over 60 countries at no extra cost. This opens up a smorgasbord of stuff to watch that I wouldn't normally be able to without NordVPN. NordVPN is also the fastest VPN out there, so you won't have to sacrifice speed for the sake of your shows. It's what we use at the new Rockstars offices, and let me tell you, it is fast. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, I get to have premium cybersecurity on six devices and gain access to streaming services from over 60 countries at no extra cost. It's also available on every platform. To grab your exclusive NordVPN deal, go to NordVPN slash New Rockstars to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan, plus a bonus gift. NordVPN has a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can try NordVPN completely risk-free. Just click the link in the description to get started. One of my favorite parts of this trailer shows Holga's axe getting an upgrade, turning multiple just like when your DM levels up your weapons in actual D&D with a little homebrew. John and John confirmed that the next scene in the trailer, where it appears that the group is fighting Sophina, is actually a couple of different fights in the movie spliced together to make the trailer flow. So these fiery meteors that Sophina is flinging from the sky aren't actually what causes the stone dragon to come to life. The caster must have used animate objects, a spell that brings objects to life, turning those objects into a creature at your command for its duration. The statue itself seems to be a depiction of a copper dragon. Next, we see Revel's end a prison built on a cliffside overlooking the sea of moving ice in the frozen far region of the north. It holds only the most serious and hardcore of criminals, so you know that whatever battle takes place here is gonna be gruesome. Forge Fitzwilliams is definitely gonna be one sneaky son of a gun in this film. John Francis Daly tells us, although he seems to be on board with our band of thieves in the beginning, it's later revealed that he has plans and motivations of his own. I also think it's possible that he's the new Lord of Neverwinter, which could be why he's holding these weird Colosseum hunger games with his prisoners. During one of the many dungeon crawls promised in this movie, we see the gang running through a maze set up in the arena, dodging displacer beasts and mimics, and even diving into a gelatinous cube. In this fight scene, Zank battles Dralis in the Underdark, surrounded by Duragar priest statues. Zank is using the dagger sword that we saw in the last trailer, and Dralis uses the cantrip green flame blade against his opponent. Sophina Misty steps away from the owlbear, who we know is Doric in one of her wild shape forms. Funnily enough, I totally called it in my last breakdown. The director masters are definitely using the rule of cool in this scenario, which they confirmed in their interview. Even though druids technically can't wild shape into owlbears or use dimension doorway, Doric can because doing something that whips absolute ass is always way more fun than following the rules. All right, here's where I need some help from my fellow D&D nerds. I was poring over my monster manual for hours last night and I couldn't figure out what this monster is. John and Jonathan referred to it as a black tentacle, but lol. Do you know how many D&D creatures have tentacles? like a bunch of them. Now it could be the spell Everd's Black Tentacle, but considering that Forge is a rogue with an arena of monsters at his disposal, I'm leaning more towards it not being magic. If y'all know what this little guy choking out Chris Pine is supposed to be, let me know in the comments. Here's the deal with the next scene. Sophina uses a spell that the directors call Mage Hand, but the spell she performs here seems to be a lot more in line with Bigsby's hand spells. I think that they may have pulled inspiration for this Mage Hand from Bigsby's Grasping Hand. It forms a hand the size of an ogre that follows and grabs your target, and can also be used to shove or block. Mage hands are usually used to perform a task like unlocking a door or moving an object, and cannot be used to attack your opponent, which is why I think that they incorporated elements of big beats. Simon uses the transmutation spell Maximilian's Earth and Grasp to intercept the hand, saving Doric. This spell causes the Earth to grab and restrain your target. Here we see Sophina's rotting blackened hand. This could be a side effect of her zombification, but it could also be her gearing up for the spell Finger of Death, which allows its caster to attack to cause instant death. Another version of this spell can also raise people killed by it from the dead, turning them into zombies as well. When we see Sophina's face a moment later, she's all grody as if she's halfway through a necromancy ritual to obtain Sostam's ancient power. The next shot was described by the director and writer as the moment our heroes come together and really showcase their strongest abilities. What's cool to me is that the way this fight is filmed almost feels like the characters are taking turns with the action, just like in a real D&D game. A round of D&D translates to about six seconds of simultaneous action, and we're likely seeing a take on those mechanics in this scene. On to my other favorite part of the trailer, Bember Chow! 
crowd. Just look at him. He's just a big hungry boy who has clearly eaten hundreds of past adventurers based on the skeletons surrounding the team. And he's about to eat one more after he open mouth power slides down that hill of bones. Finally, Zenk tells the crew in the Underdark that the bridge they're about to cross is protected by an ancient trap that must not be triggered lest they fall and perish. Simon instantly activates the mechanism, causing the bridge to tumble into the lava below, which is definitely a scenario I've seen played out at my table. Someone rolls poorly and triggers a death trap, the paladin gets all self-serious about it, and the party has to put their heads together to improvise a new plan. I know that they're traveling to Gracklesta, but I also think that they may have once again borrowed inspiration from another part of D&D lore. Mount Houghton now is a volcano in the Crags Mountain range northeast of Neverwinter that's dormant in our world, but active in Shadowfell, producing constantly flowing rivers of lava. Our guys definitely are not in the plane of shadows here. That's more of a Stranger Things upside down scenario. But I wonder if the ever flowing lava stream that they have to cross in this movie was inspired by Mount Houghton Now's dark spooky twin. There are always new things to learn with D&D lore, so let me know if I missed any Easter eggs in the comments. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Whitney Puppy, follow New Rockstars, subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love, and thanks for watching. Bye.